uh, or good evening in whatever time zone people are in. And thanks for joining us for the Life Course Research Network webinar made possible by funding from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. I'm Neil Half, and I'm director of the UCLA Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities. And today, we're very excited to kick off new uh, webinar series on measuring health development uh, of children and youth. Uh, this is a series of webinars that'll explore strategies for developing measurement systems to monitor and improve children's health development trajectories. We will focus uh, in this webinar series on the early development uh, instrument and the metal development instrument uh, as tools to gather information, inform policies, program, and uh, inform research. These uh, two instruments uh, have had uh, uh, important uh, impacts on the work that is being done in Australia um, and Canada and in many other uh, parts of the world now. Uh, I'm particularly happy that we're doing this because it's almost uh, 18 years ago uh, that I was first introduced to the EDI uh, by one of our uh, speakers, who I'll introduce in a se second, uh, Magdalena Janis. Um, and from the very first instant that I saw what the EDI was about, what it could do, and how it was used, and what was going on with it, I realized that it was an invaluable uh, measure um, of uh, children's health development and well-being could be used in a variety of ways, and we'll start to hear about some of that today. Also recognize that it was the, the uh, an important part of what would become a life course measurement system. And when the middle development instrument uh, came along, uh, second in a series of instruments, uh, well on our way towards actually building new population health data systems where longitudinal trajectories of population could actually be measured. Uh, we're also very happy to be hosting this for a, a variety of other reasons, one being that we've been uh, working with Magdalena um, and her team at McMaster's and Martin and the team at the Human Early Learning Partnership in uh, British Columbia for the last almost 18 years now um, as we've begun to use both instruments here in the U.S. Uh, and we're hoping that as uh, through this um, webinar series will allow others to understand both the importance and value of not just the instruments but the whole approach that they allow as we move towards measuring um, health um, of populations, health development of populations. So <clears throat> today's webinar um, is an introduction uh, to a comprehensive life course monitoring system. It's featuring Dr. Martin Goon, who's an assistant professor at the uh, Human Early Learning Partnership in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia, and Dr. Magdalena Janus, who's professor at the Authored Center uh, for Child Studies at uh, McMaster's University, both in Canada. Dr. Goon draws from the EDI and MDI research to conduct research on social, cultural, and demographic, social, economic determinants of children and adolescents' developmental health, well-being, and educational trajectories. It's also very interested in school and community-based knowledge to action research. Dr. Janice and her team have helped implement the EDI in Canada for over a million children. <coughs> and have facilitated its adaptation internationally. Dr. Janus is interested in researching the transitions to school for children with special needs and indicators of early child uh, development. Just a few quick technical comments. We're, we're, we've been doing these webinars for uh, several years, but this is the first time we're doing it with a uh, Zoom system. So we've been working out a few bugs this morning. So hopefully all will move uh, forward smoothly and also just to let you know we're recording the webinars um, as well. During the presentation all participants will be muted but as a precaution please be sure that your phone or microphone is in the mute mode. Following the presentations we will have uh, follow-up activity and discussion 
for which you may raise your hand, um, uh, use the raise the hand function to participate. If you'd like to submit a question, please do so using the chat function also as we uh, move forward. Um, and this webinar is scheduled to be about an hour and a half. We're starting a few minutes late, but we scheduled that way so that we could uh, uh, make sure that we can have plenty of time for uh, question and answer. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, turn it over to our presenters. Can everybody hear me? Can I start? Yes, Magdalene, I can hear you. Okay, great. So any, everybody can see my first slide. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Neil and, um, and uh, your colleagues for inviting Martin and me to do this. It's a great pleasure. I also wanted to thank you, Neil, for uh, reminding me of a very stimulating and very fruitful meeting in, uh, in January 2002. It's scary to think how long ago that was. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, you'll see from both what, uh, what I have to say and Martin and together as, as a group we have that, that um, there has been certain progress in, in terms of understanding child development, maybe not necessarily in improving children's outcomes. Um, we'll, um, we'll still just have to work a little bit more on that. Um, in terms of sharing uh, the presentation, uh, I think mo both of us have mostly uh, showing data that have been published, but uh, I think if you wanted to use particular graphs or particular quotes from us, we, we both provide you with contact uh, information. So feel free to contact us after the meeting. Let me start. Um, and I think I really appreciate the, the opportunity to give the introductory introductory part to this series. It sounds really uh, interesting because it's it's also an opportunity for us to uh, talk a little bit about the roots of this um, now population level understanding and uh, opportunities of development through um, data collected uh, with early development instrument. Um, and it really started in the latter part um, of, of uh, last uh, century uh, when the concept of children's school readiness to learn and the national goals panel, um, um, uh, national action panel goals in the United States uh, wanted to make sure that children all reach school ready to learn, but um, it, uh, it really didn't have much attached to it in, this, in, a, in a sense of action. Um, and um, the, uh, the understanding of how much more than genetics influences people's behavior and uh, people's success in life, especially with evidence for, um, for adults, was also growing. And then in the um, latter part, as I said, of, of last century through um, pioneers such as Dan Offord, who was a child psychiatrist and epidemiologist, Clyde Hertzman, Fraser Master, Tom Boyd, um, the um, focus started being um, given to uh, child development. And um, through um, representative studies, through sample studies, it has many of them from the United States, but some in Canada, um, researchers noticed that the gradient in outcomes were also uh, be, um, evident in, uh, in children's outcomes, children's educational outcomes. Those that were coming from um, more disadvantaged neighborhoods that had uh, parents with less uh, education advantage, well, on average, faring much worse in later educational um, uh, careers, as for example. The, the concept of social determinants of health was kind of coming to the fore. Uh, and this was to give emphasis that there are factors beyond biology that influence health of population. And the work of Clyde Hertzman and Dan Keating and um, Tom Boyd has shown that the way this, um, this um, environmental influence, the context with which, in which child develops, uh, gets so-called under the skin is through the biological, what they call the biological embedding. And that's because um, when um, there isn't, there are certain circumstances that happen in early childhood, they are being reinforced because they determine the trajectory to a certain extent, how child, where child will go, where they will develop, which, what kind of resources they will have access to, what kind of opportunities they'll be able to see. And these are reinforced and then result in long-term associations and long-term outcomes. Um, in order to um, have a certain, um, in order to understand um, where, it's not changing, sorry. <laughs> um, 
the um, the point here was that sometimes there could be um, people with the same or very similar um, circumstances, but because of what's happening in the context of their early experiences, that could um, influence later outcomes. And I would like to change my my apologies. Um, what really um, I wanted to show with this slide, which comes from a neuroscientific study that um, in which um, a volume of um, children's brain and gray matter was followed from from birth to age three was if you look at the um, at the this part of the, uh, the five to seven month range uh, for ch child's age you'll see there is absolutely no difference uh, in relation to this economic um, status in which this uh, this family finds uh, themselves whereas there is a meaningful difference um, there is a gradient in terms of socioeconomic status by the time the child uh, the, children reach three years of age. And so basically that neuro, neuroscience uh, helps us um, to um, illustrate that there really uh, is a major impact of um, this environment that gets under the skin. And when we, um, when the people here that you can see and to whom I'm always um, um, would like to um, give tribute to Fraser Master, Dan Offord and Clyde Hurston, um, when they had this idea that we really should be able to monitor child development at a population level. They realized that we really don't have any um, instrument. The data that uh, were coming were coming from sample-based studies and they, to a certain extent, they were very useful, but they were not showing the full picture because communities would say they're not relevant to us. Um, our children were not in your study. And the same actually could have happened at the political level. Politicians could say, you know, there is not, no disadvantage because this study does not inform my community. So the, the concept that we wanted to measure was really much wider than what um, has been talked about as school readiness, because at that time, so late um, late 20th century, um, the school readiness was supposed to be acad mostly academic reading and writing. The developmental health concept is put forward by Dan Keating and Clyde Hertzman really encompasses a wide range of the developmental outcomes, physical, mental, behavioral adjustment, literacy, mathematics, achievement. And in that context, Dan Offord has a form and, and his colleague has formulated this kind of request, this understanding that we really need more than just a measurement of one type of outcomes and more than just a kind of sample based studies. We really need um, something that would be useful for social reporting at the community level that would be feasible and socially acceptable to people. And basically what we needed were, were data to monitor child development over time in context reliable at the population level in order to achieve a bioecological understanding of child development from birth to later years. But at that time, so about 18, 20 years ago, we really were in a position to, uh, we, we thought that we needed that kind of anchor age. And what was the age where the most um, uh, information was available to children when they started school? We knew that all children are born ready to, are born ready to learn. So unless they have major developmental um, delays, they really, um, their, their neural system is open to take in any stimulation that they receive, the, the, um, the connections are forming. But over that, what happens over that period of the first five years before they enter school, they all enter kindergarten with optimal developmental health, so more than that, um, a little bit more than the school readiness. And as a result of this um, conceptual and kind of uh, critical need, um, the instrument we now formally call early development instrument was developed um, through the um, requirements, the framework of, of um, implementation. The EDI is a population level measure of child development. It um, measures five uh, major developmental domains. Um, it is completed by kindergarten teachers for each child in their classroom. That's making population level. And it's very important here to understand the distinction between population base, which is basically samples from a population, and population level, which means that you cover the whole uh, pathway. Excuse me, Magdalena. Would it be possible? We're just getting some feedback from folks. It's a little hard to hear you. Can you um, uh, increase the volume or speak a little bit closer to the mic? This I'm, I have my mic on my head, so okay. I think there is not very much that I can do. Uh, I think it's probably the connection, but I'll try to make sure that I speak a little louder. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. 
next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is the five domains of child development that um, the EDI covers, um, physical health and well-being, social competence, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, and communication skills and general knowledge. Next slide. Um, the um, EDI, the main measures are the mean average scores on each of the five domains. We do not recommend uh, use of a total score because the total score, if we pretty much average the, the all five domains, we may really um, have children who do well in one area of development, but not so much in another. And it would really hide their vulnerability. So the, um, the idea was to have a different way of, of scoring the information from the EDI, and that was the concept of vulnerability. So for each of the five domains um, in Canada, based on a normative sample of just over 160,000 children, we've um, established cutoffs at the 10th percentile of the distribution. And for each of the domain, the score is, um, each child's score is compared with that boundary, 10th percentile boundary, and a child is deemed vulnerable or not on each of the domains. Then if a child has vulnerability on at least one of the domains, um, they are called overall vulnerable, which often is important to vulnerability. Um, in that way, and in that early age, it really is important to recognize that um, even one area of development may really be detrimental to children's later outcomes. And actually, in actual fact, our validity studies show that it matters far less which domain children are vulnerable, but it really matters that they are vulnerable on at least one for their future development. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, with the data like the EDI, and we'll be um, referring to that um, a little bit later, both uh, Martin and myself, there is quite a lot of opportunity. So because of the inclusive and consistent national coverage in Canada, uh, since 2004 of that population of children just before grade one entry, we really have opportunities to create uh, linkages, um, both with concurrent data, place level data, health data, health data, but also linkages across um, ages and across jurisdictions. Next slide. Um, and um, the EDI, as you can see here, kind of anchors at five years because this is the first um, um, time when ch children enter uh, broad um, uh, system that, uh, that could be accessible in terms of uh, understanding child development um, that is available at a population level. But Martin will um, populate the rest of that graph in terms of the children's age with the uh, potential for measurement and linkage later on. On top, you, you see here that this is how the EDI ready, uh, EDI's results are in, where that, that's where our vision was, um, Dan and Clive and Fraser's, where they will be useful, not just on, a, on their own as an in one indicator of child development, but really the interpretation will have to go through understanding of the neighborhood context and all the other contextual data that now we are linking with through education and medical records and anything else that we can possibly find. Next, please. So this is where um, you know, uh, Martin will kind of expand in terms of um, the availability of various uh, measurements. So the EDI is actually a little bit of an anomaly because this is the only one that the teacher completes about the child. The ones on the earlier, the other ones on the younger age would be a parent um, uh, completed instrument and the MDI is the instrument that's completed by the child themselves. Next slide. So um, to continue from the uh, slide that I showed you a minute ago, uh, yes, all children are born ready to learn, but 20, in Canada, 27% of kindergarten children are vulnerable at school entry. And it's, it's already a, a high number, but when you think about the fact that this number varies between jurisdictions, and by that I mean our provinces, uh, territories, between 17 to 42 percent, that really is something that um, is very troublesome. And um, this number can vary even more if you go down to smaller geographic levels. Next slide. So why is it important? Well, it's very important because children who are vulnerable in kindergarten are at least twice more likely to experience academic and social difficulties in later grades. Um, and there is already quite a lot of information, quite a lot of validity and predictive studies that show, show us. So those dark clouds that kind of gather for children, unfortunately, in those early years, are not going to dissipate. Uh, they really reinforce this lack of opportunities, our lack of resources for uh, 
this state the children um, have been in um, kindergarten. Next slide. So in Canada, from 2004 to 2018, uh, we have collected the EDI data for over a million children in 12 out of the 13 um, Canadian provinces and territories. And overall level of vulnerability is 27%. And we see very strong differences between boys and girls and um, association with vulnerability um, levels uh, with the expected um, uh, demographic characteristics. Um, what uh, hampered us a little bit in terms of um, producing um, uh, these results that uh, we have had over the past 12 years, 14 years, was the fact that the, uh, in, in Canada the EDI data are collected provincially. So this is great because the provinces have their own programs in terms of how to use the data and what to do with them. And, uh, neighborhoods are being established um, provincially and, and um, data are linked to provincial sources. So in Ontario, for example, there is a, um, a, a poverty uh, index that the EDI does play a contribute to, which is something different that other provinces are doing. But what really we were hampered uh, through these provincial implementations um, in terms of comparability. So um, a few years back, uh, Mark Kin and I, and that was work that was led by Clyde, but unfortunately passed away uh, in the first year of the project. Um, we've set on to harmonize the EDI data from various jurisdictions in order to be able to come up with definitions of neighborhood that would be comparable across provinces and also uh, that we would able be able to add um, sociodemographic data available for population, so from tax buyers and from census. Um, so in our database, we have just about 800,000 uh, valid EDIs. And in our database, we have 29% of children who are overall vulnerable. And But if you look um, underneath that, the variation, the difference between the neighborhood with the lowest um, vulnerability and the highest is huge. It's over 70%, 70 points. So really that one number, which uh, quite often people say, okay, give me one number about well, the state of child development. Yeah, we can give you that, but the more, what, way more information is in that difference. And similarly to the uh, socioeconomic um, status index that we developed using 10 variables, um, four from census and six from the taxpayer data, which we centered in the census data that we had available for 2006. And then when we reapply this to the next uh, round of data that we had, um, it varied from 49 to 153. So again, there's quite a bit of variation in terms of what our neighborhood, uh, what happens to children in our neighborhood. Next one, please. What followed on the um, heels of the Connect study uh, was the Canadian Children's Health in Context study, which um, which objectives are very similar to our first study, but um, it includes children with health concerns. So on the EDI, we have information whether a child has, has special needs as they enter school, whether they have a medical diagnosis, whether they have functional impairment. And uh, we're um, following um, that database with um, similar methodologies as we applied with child science with typically developing children. Next. Um, so, um, what you can see from this table is that first we've looked at to what extent the neighborhood SES uh, index explains variation in um, children's um, vulnerability um, per domain. So for typically developing children, you can see the results in the middle uh, column and for children with special needs on the right hand side. And sometimes people would say, well, you know, children with special needs and health disorders, like why would neighborhood has, have anything to do to in, in their outcomes because they will go where resources are. They wouldn't necessarily just rely on the resources in the neighborhood as typically developing children do. And, but when you look at those two, um, two um, percentages, uh, with an exception of communication skills and general knowledge, the percentages are very similar, which basically tells us that the disadvantage act, disadvantage, neighborhood level disadvantage acts on children with and without special needs in a very similar way. And this is a really important finding that um, has to be taken uh, more, uh, more broadly into the Next, please. Um, so um, 
Martin will talk a little bit more about these other um, aspects that we are trying to complement the EDI data with. So complement would be at the same time um, that we collect the EDI data, we're trying to get some information about the environment um, that children are growing in and how that may in impact their development. So this is an example of the data combining the EDI results in um, three domains, so physical language and communication skills. And information from parents, um, our kindergarten parent survey, where we were asking um, uh, parents how often they were doing various community activities with children. And without going into too much detail about what it was, the, the five lines represent uh, five different um, levels of income. And I think if there is one take home message from those three, you can see that the top line on each of the graphs, which is purple, is pretty much uh, flat. So. For children who are in the highest income levels, whether their parents do a lot of community activities with them is really or not, it really doesn't make any difference to their development. But for the lowest income group, which is the blue line at the very bottom, um, it appears to be uh, to make a difference. So this is really a very uh, important result in terms of being able to um, recommend community activities that are accessible, which was something that Dan offered very um, had very much in heart that community resources not only have to be there, but they have to be accessible to children who need them. And this um, key data are not quite covered. Next, please. So majority of the, uh, as you will see in a second, the majority of the um, information uh, and interesting results that we're getting from using um, EI data comes from linkages with other data. In Canada, the three provinces that have these very uh, well set up linkages, um, uh, Manitoba especially, British Columbia and Ontario, and other provinces are kind of catching up. Um, next, please. At the forefront of the linkages of EDI with other data is, the, however, Australia. And those studies mostly come from Western Australia, South Australia, and New South Wales. And uh, I know that you're going to have Sharon Gold um, uh, give a, a webinar on Australian EDI. Uh, soon, um, but I just wanted to highlight here that the EDI in Australia started in 2003. Um, Dan Offord went um, uh, and gave a lecture, a series of lectures in Australia, and people in Western Australia were really interested and adapted the, the EDI um, and used um, the, the data, um, used their instrument in their pilot in 2003, which led to really more interest uh, and to the um, projects, um, community based project that included communities, which then led, uh, and the instrument was renamed Early, Australian Early Development Index, and then finally um, led to national implementation of Australian Early Development Census. So if you ever are interested in Australian data, all these three um, acronyms will come up, but it's really the same instrument. Next, please. Um, we at the Offord Center are very conscientious about collecting information about every single piece of research that's published using EDI data. And so if you um, want to um, check this out, uh, you can go to um, our website and under resources, you can find photography of the EDI that was taken uh, less than two years ago. For example, in um, last year, in 2018, um, 28 papers in our list, and um, it's really interesting that the majority of the papers, about two thirds of them, um, published um, results on uh, using data linkages, either with prior um, information, so diagnosis of children, um, children's exposure to neurotoxicity, to anesthesia, uh, testing for um, TSH or um, uh, maternal depression at birth, etc. However, there were also studies that looked at cross-sectional data, about a quarter of them. Some were protocol or resource um, uh, studies, and uh, we had a couple of papers only that looked at intervention results. In terms of country of origin, I think our collective goal here would be to make that US a uh, little twice of a time as we put it together, but majority of this comes from, from Australia, and I'm happy to say that the study in the US is the same thing in New York City. Next, please. Um, I think I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about this one paper that ni neither Martin nor I um, have been involved with. It's, uh, it's a study done in Australia, but it really shows to what extent the, um, the opportunities of the database, like the EDI, 
opens up uh, opportunities to uh, not only look at children's developmental outcomes and uh, environmental um, influences, but other um, issues that are really relevant to health policy. Um, so here is an Australian study where they looked at the screening um, of, um, of children for TSH. And the current um, boundary for that screen for children to receive treatment is 99.9 percentile. Um, so children who receive, who screen about that, receive treatment and their odds ratios for the risk ratio for being vulnerable in kindergarten is the same as for children who have uh, very low risk um, uh, for, um, for congenital heterosclerosis. However, children who screen between 95th and 99.9 percentile, 99.5, so they have high levels, but not high enough that right now are mandated for treatment, are actually at much higher odds to um, be at risk in kindergarten than children who actually have high levels and then are treated. So that's really the authors of the paper really praise this, um, these results in the public health um, kind of framework on saying, well, first, should more children receive screening, but at the same time understanding that that could have potential for um, higher costs of um, next please. So I think what I really wanted to um, finish my part here with is that the, um, the these papers that show linkages that um, how uh, we can link the child developmental outcomes at the population level. So for all children, that are the majority, the large population of children, very few are not in our database. It really gives us opportunities for answering new questions, questions that we may not even have known that could be answered, and opportunities for monitoring children's health prior to school entry, concurrent complement data, um, academic achievement, social network, school graduation, and health outcomes, and pretty much all of these will be addressed in Mark's presentation. Next, please. At this point, I wanted to thank you very much for attention. I wanted to apologize for the issues with my slides, but I think we managed to sort them out, and these are the, the, the websites where you can find the best materials. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Magdalena. Can can people hear me now? I think it just got unmuted. Yes, perfect. Great. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Magdalena. <clears throat> thank you very much, Whitney and Erica and Neil for the invitation and introduction. So I'll uh, say a few words about what we call this comprehensive population-based child development monitoring system and uh, how a large network of researchers and ministry folks and community folks are trying to build this monitoring system based on the success of the uh, EDI. So if you look at the bottom of the pictures, we're trying to understand developmental trajectories all the way from conception into uh, adolescence and early adulthood. And uh, the EDI is, of course, a tool that we have already heard uh, lots about from, from Magdalena. So the question is, how do we extend uh, this monitoring to understand what happens in life earlier and later on? And before I go into some concrete aspects of the data collection, the linkages, I'll uh, say a few words about a conceptual framework that has helped guide our work. Um, let's see, is this... Um, the framework uh, is in some sense an iteration of other bioecological frameworks that have been formulated before by, uh, by psychologists such as Yuri Bronfenbrenner and others. Uh, it was uh, done by Clyde Hertzman with Laurie Owen and Arjuman Siddiqui, and they called this holistic early child development assess uh, assessment model the total environment assessment model of early child development. And the gist of this is that if we want to understand early child development trajectories and how they affect lifelong health and well-being, we really have to monitor 
multiple ecologies, multiple social contexts and factors of children's development over time. So the vision for us is to really understand how the individual child develops over time within the context of family processes, within things that are happening in the neighborhood, the residential area, uh, regional factors, whether they be cultural, social, economic, or other else uh, otherwise. National programs, federal supports, the situation uh, economically, uh, global environment in terms of climate change, globalization, uh, global trends in terms of markets and so forth. And then of course we have to think in, in terms of human development from a relational community perspective. So what are our networks? They're not always nested geographically but they cut across uh, regions. Uh, but are very important for our development. We have to understand how early child development services and programs affect child development and how these things all interact within the civil society we set up across institutional and historical time. So all to say is it's a very, very complex overall picture and the question is how do you translate that complex conceptual model of child development trajectories into something that is feasible from a measurement and monitoring perspective and uh, then doing meaningful research with it. So our vision for this monitoring network has been to uh, really collect data that allows us to create a biologic understanding of child development and the foundation of this has been the EDI really as the endpoint of the early years. Uh, of course we have to link early years outcomes and experiences to later life course. Uh, Magdalena already talked about the advantages of collecting at a population level as opposed to working with samples so that we can map and examine variability at small uh, jurisdictional or local areas. And then one of the technical challenges and privacy challenges is to link all these data sets, uh, let alone collecting them. How do we link them? at an individual level so that we can follow children over time. Uh, and we are doing this by using personal education numbers and other unique identifiers such as health numbers and, and so forth, which allow us to connect health data, education records and our own data at the individual child level over time. So the EDI, has been fascinating as a tool in its own right. Uh, you've seen a few examples presented by Magdalena. One thing I'll uh, do for the BC context, and I'll say that I will be BC centric in my examples because I'm most familiar with uh, the research studies that have taken place here. But one thing that we've been able to do is look at trends over time. And uh, Manitoba, Ontario, a couple other provinces have done uh, similar things. Uh, this is 15 years in the making, so I came here as a grad student in 2003, hearing Neil Halfon uh, reflect on the history of this. It's been a long time in the making, and so when we saw these trend lines, uh, we were all quite excited because now we can see what's happening over time with these kindergarten child cohorts. And at the bottom you see a time axis going from wave two, which was the BC data collection in 2002 to 2004, all the way to wave five uh, in 2012 to 2014. So it spans a time window of about 10 years. And what we're seeing that for the language and cognitive development domain, which is really about early literacy and numeracy, we see that EDI vulnerability is decreasing. So it started at around 12% and now it's at around nine. So you could say this is a good news story. At the same time, same children, we saw that the trends for the social competence and emotional maturity domain were increasing in terms of vulnerability. So things gotten worse. These are the scales that measure anxious behavior, aggressive behavior, pro-social behavior, uh, getting along with your peers and so forth. So if you put these two trends together, we see that they're going in different directions. It certainly has spurred lots of hypotheses and questions in terms of what's going on societally. Uh, here in BC, we've seen similar trends with regard to numeracy and literacy in some of the other provinces and maybe less pronounced with some of the social emotional domains. So it raises big questions about what's culturally or socially or uh, at the provincial or federal level changing in our society with regard to child development. So 
one of the important linkages uh, through the first uh, kind of life period or life phase of the EDI has been linking it to neighborhood context data through obtaining census data and tax filer data from Statistics Canada. You saw a couple examples from Magdalena and I'll just highlight one uh, additional piece that we've started looking at with our pan-Canadian group where we not only kind of try to explain the variability. Here's an example uh, of Vancouver, uh, the city here on the West Coast, uh, where you see color coded the variability and vulnerability rates in, at the neighborhood level. So very dark red means high vulnerability here in the Strathcona area, and the very light means low vulnerability. And as Magdalena pointed out, there's a high correlation with socioeconomic status. When we plot this for the whole country, each bubble is representing a neighborhood uh, in Canada, and the larger bubbles mean more children living in those neighborhoods. What's been really fascinating is, yes, we do see a gradient overall. So lower median income, which is plotted at the bottom, overall correlates with higher vulnerability rates plotted here at the y-axis. But what was interesting in the top right quadrant, there's no neighborhood, so there's really no neighborhood that has very high median income and high vulnerability rates. Whereas if you go to the low SES range, the low income range, we saw a lot of variability. And what we're currently exploring using the social capital data that Magdalena has collected in Ontario with the kindergarten parent survey and that we have collected through a survey here in BC, to see to what extent social capital or other factors may help us understand why we see that such great variability in terms of vulnerability rates at the low income range. Uh, another linkage that has uh, finally come to fruition and has been over 10 years in the making, uh, Clyde in fact started this in the mid-2000s uh, with the first request, has been linking the EDI data to medical records. Uh, and one interesting um, example is based on some work that was led by uh, Kim Thompson, who was a doctoral student here at HELP. And she first categorized children into these profiles. Uh, so here's the title from the publication if you want to go into more depth. But the children were categorized into these social emotional health profiles according to the EDI data. Uh, and what we found is that you, the, you know, the, the large majority, about 58%, uh, we're in a group that is really characterized by doing well on all these social emotional subscales on the EDI. But then for a range of the other groups, you see that there's quite a bit of cross crossover. For some, anxiety was the main concern or aggressive uh, hyperactive behavior for these two groups, whereas for others, the patterns were slightly reversed. So that was interesting in its own right, just to describe the child population from a profile perspective. But then even more interesting was that when you use these profiles to predict mental health outcomes by linking it to health records, um, we saw that there's uh, highly increased odds for these vulnerable groups. So the groups that you see here at the bottom had much higher odds for developing later on uh, mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, conduct disorder, and so forth. And that uh, study was published here and then 2019. So again, I'm water skiing over these, but if you have uh, more questions, please let me know. Or of course you can uh, look for more in, in the publication itself. So apart from linking to the medical records of the children themselves, another PhD student who worked here at HELP, uh, Neda Razas, she, she linked EDI data to the medical records of the parents for which we had EDI data. And in this particular case, she looked at multiple sclerosis, that was her area of interest. And without going into much detail about the findings, the interesting piece is that we now can look at parental health outcomes, in this case, multiple sclerosis, and the child development outcomes from a fairly holistic perspective using the EDI data and see to what extent they are differ, different from the general population. So here what you're seeing is that for each child that had a parent with MS, they were matched to children with similar demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. And you see that in this particular case, actually the vulnerability rates were uh, mostly lower, uh, not always significantly lower for the children of uh, parents with MS. So again, without going into the specific interpretation of this, 
The exciting part here is that we can now look at intergenerational associations between parental health and child development outcomes. Um, what you see here in this slide is that we added education records uh, to uh, that linkage. So now we can look at grades, academic achievement, standardized achievement scores uh, in the school setting. We can link those to medical records, health outcomes, and to the EDI scores, and of course the census data, which are linked at the aggregate neighborhood level. And I'll just uh, showcase uh, a couple of findings from, from that type of research where we were able to link academic data for refugee children. So it didn't just mean to go to the Ministry of Education and get educational data, but we also got from the immigration office at the federal level information on which children came here as refugees and which ones didn't. This work was led by Monique Garnier, and what she found is that you can categorize children according to their trajectories. And you, what you see here at the top is a trajectory that's fairly kind of even. They're average, above average. They're doing fine. Uh, and they keep doing fine if you follow them from kindergarten all the way to grade seven. Then there are other children that start off doing okay, about average, but then they fall behind. So we call them the declining group. And then there's a group that doesn't look so strong when you look at their EDI scores early on, but over time they catch up. They're, they start low, but they're improving. And what Monique was able to show is that the children the, among the refugees, those who were emotionally unstable, they, were, they looked fine in the beginning on average, but over time they fell behind. So there was the emotional foundation wasn't there and other things kind of got kind of in the way of learning. Whereas the children who may have struggled kind of in terms of their numeracy literacy early on, but they were stable in terms of their emotional and social development, they over time, they caught up on the language and other things and they uh, improved. So all to say is we can do really interesting things in terms of looking at trajectories and what predicts those trajectories for subpopulations uh, among our, our children. Just checking with time, I think we're um, um, still good. Um, so now the tool that Neil Halfon mentioned in the introduction, the MDI Middle Years Development Instrument you see here in orange at the bottom. So apart from doing all these exciting linkages, what we didn't really have at a systematic level was the social environment of children. And so what uh, we developed with the lead of Kim Schonert Reichel, who is the current director here at, at HELP, was the Middle Years Development Instrument. There are three uh, papers that specifically describe the tool and its development validation. So for your interest, I put the references um, here. But I'll focus on describing the tool itself, it's a self report. So it's children sitting down in the school setting, in our case in grade four and grade seven, but you can do it at any kind of age within age to uh, the 10 to 15 age range. And they're filling out questions on a range of domains that we think are of interest for, for that age period. So five scales fall under what we call the well-being index we look at their life satisfaction their subjective health their optimism their self-esteem and their depressive symptoms or their sadness we take all that information and categorize it into thriving medium and low well-being then on the context side we ask children about their adult relationships at home and school we ask them about their after school activity involvement their nutrition and sleep habits and their peer relationships and now that we have all those puzzle pieces we can um, link them, sorry, we can map them the same way we map EDI outcomes. So here's an example of the lower mainland in BC. For uh, the city of Coquitlam, you see that we see similar variability in terms of children thriving according to their self-report when you go from neighborhood to neighborhood. And we did find that this also correlates with uh, socioeconomic factors, not too, not too surprisingly. What we also do is we map these social assets, adult relationships, peer relationships, after school activities, and nutrition and sleep. And when you put them all together, you find a very, very strong linear relationship between the number of assets that are present at a child or community level and the overall thriving index. So it really filled a gap in terms of understanding the social environment of children during the middle years uh, period. 
what we've been able to do is link the data on the EDI to our MDI data and academic achievement data. So again, I'm putting the citation here in case anybody wants to look into it with further detail. But here's the uh, just in terms of the findings. So we linked EDI data to some scales from the MDI, student self-report, and then we link the EDI data to some academic outcomes data. The FSA stands for Foundational Skills Assessment, which is a standardized test here in, in grade four in British Columbia. And what we find, and this is primarily kind of a validation study, that the EDI social competence and EDI emotional maturity scales were really the two scales that most strongly connected or predicted the student self-rated connectedness with peers and their emotional well-being in grade four. And at the same time, the language and cognitive development, so early literacy, numeracy, and kindergarten age, predicted most strongly the reading and math scores in grade four. And social competence was still a significant contribution with regard to a couple of the scores. So all to say is we do see a signal and it speaks to the validity of the EDI uh, in terms of teacher ratings uh, still being connected to student tests and self ratings four or five years later. Just doing a quick check here. Um, I'm, I, I realize I'm zooming through some of this and it's been all, you know, about an hour for everybody to listen. Any questions or any comments? Um, at this point. Uh, Martin, I think this is going very well. I think we could um, open it up for questions now, or if you, you have, how many more slides do you have? Um, just, um, you know, I'll, I'll basically point out two, three more linkages uh, and say a couple of minutes about what we're currently doing with early years collection, and then I'll open it up. So if you give me three minutes, I'll be done. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, great. So um, for your reference, um, there was a special issue in 2016. Uh, it's a bit of a coming of age for the EDI because it's a collection of over a dozen of papers that look at a whole range of different research areas, but they all are based on linkages and comprise studies from Australia, uh, Hong Kong, and uh, Canada. Um, there's been a recent successful uh, grant application to link our data uh, with geospatial environmental data, so specifically air pollution and noise pollution. So it will be really interesting to see to what extent that will uh, create more insights about how social and environmental factors play together. There's um, a protocol paper published in case you're interested and the, 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 the basic idea is to link what you see here on the left is EDI vulnerability rates at the neighborhood level or at the individual level to uh, geospatial environmental data, whether it's land use, pollution, uh, air pollution or noise pollution. So uh, I'm part, I'm a co-PI, but this is led by people who are really in the environmental uh, health area. One gap that's still remaining and we're currently working on has to do with early childhood experiences and social context. So even though we now know when, how children are doing when they enter the kindergarten uh, or school system, we don't really know too much systematically about what's happening to them beforehand. And so we have been developing uh, a suite of new surveys. Uh, Magdalena mentioned them briefly. The one is a toddler development instrument. The other one is the kindergarten parent survey and the childhood experiences questionnaire. They're all parent completed. I refer to them as siblings because they're very similar. The difference is that the TDI happens when the children are toddler aged and the KPS and check are happening when the kin children enter kindergarten. And the main purpose of these tools is to understand childhood experiences from of conception or from birth, birth to school entry, uh, looking at nutrition, outdoor play, uh, physical activity, sleep, um, social relationships, and then a whole range of uh, social context factors, um, including uh, the caregiver well-being, the social support that caregivers and their families receive, 
and some of the resources that are available to uh, families with young children in the in the community and in the neighborhood, uh, including uh, some questions on the following constructs, and then I'll wrap it up. So um, the TDI check KPS, they uh, even though they're brief, they kind of go across all the different ecological um, levels to, to ask questions about children's play, their screen time, caregiver children interactions, for example, singing, reading, health behaviors such as sleep, nutrition, access to the healthcare system, visitations to dentists, immunization clinics, so forth social support for family, whether it's from friends or family members, uh, the caregiver well-being itself, uh, example is life satisfaction uh, question, community resources and socioeconomic and demographic context. And Neil, in fact, I often think of the uh, paper where you talk about psychosocial family screening. This is all, all these questions are based on uh, very careful literature review and doing our own longitudinal analyses to identify those questions that are predictive of later health outcomes and that we think are at least partially amenable to change through action at the community or uh, higher up level. And with that, uh, I'll turn over to the um, discussion for questions, comments, and thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks very much, uh, both Magdalena and uh, Martin. Uh, um, <clears throat> are there uh, questions uh, that uh, people have? And you can either type them in or uh, you can be unmuted by raising your hand, I guess. Quite sure how to do that. Maybe seeing Again, please feel free to use the chat function or you can also raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself at this time. Oh, I see one from uh, Lisa Stanley. What has been found in terms of the predictability of the EDI and MDI as related to children's special health care needs? Magdalena, do you want to start? I, I'll just uh, I'll just pull one thing up, but Magdalena, which I think I have at my fingertips, um, because we had a study con conducted here in BC. But Magdalena, if you have anything else in the meantime, because I don't recall the findings, but at least I can forward the citation. Magdalena, you might be muted. Can you unmute? Okay, no. no I was telling me that I couldn't unmute, unmute myself. Um, so specifically, thank you, Lisa, for the question. Um, so specifically, uh, EDI to MDI? Um, no, I, I, I do not believe that any analysis like that have been done. Some analysis, we have some data showing um, strong associations with um, children's outcomes, academic outcomes later on, especially in grade three. Um, what uh, we were able to follow up was, um, for, so we have, for example, looked at children who kind of had unspecified special needs in, um, in kindergarten and looked at their status uh, in grade three, and actually not even, so, so what we found was that children who were later diagnosed with autism uh, were significantly poorer in terms of their social and emotional um, subdomains on the EDI, but better in terms of 
on, on their language and communication subdomains in comparison to children who already had special needs in kindergarten, but were um, diagnosed with different developmental delays. So that's one of the examples that we've done, but um, I think um, that linkage between EDR and MDR in this context is really very interesting. I think what may be a little bit of a barrier, um, and I will have to explore that with Martin and, and Kim and Anne, um, is to what extent some children with special needs can actually complete the MDI because it is a self-completed questionnaire. So it depends on the type of their special needs. Over to you, Mark. Yeah, thanks. I'm just seeing if I can uh, do this here. Can people see? Um, yes. yes. Okay, so uh, I just pulled this up uh, and I can't really speak to the content too much, but I, you know, I hope that uh, you can, you know, uh, look up the reference. So this is a study that was performed by Jennifer Lloyd with Laurie and Clyde uh, back in the day. And they did look at children with special needs uh, as a subpopulation and looked at their, their relationship for school readiness and their fourth grade literacy and numeracy. Um, one thing, and I'm happy to uh, share this later on, we, we started exploring a little bit in terms of special needs uh, for different special needs groups with the EDI and then also um, later on I wish there was something more conclusive but what was really interesting that the different special need categories they really and, and you know that's not my area of expertise but they really seem to reflect the different social realities so for example uh, for people who were impaired in terms of their vision or their hearing, the social relationships and connections to peers and adults in the schools, they look quite different and had different implications than for children who had maybe something that was more behavioral. Um, and uh, if you're interested, I'm happy to, uh, if nothing else, you know, share a couple of the initial analyses that we have done. But this was very exploratory because we didn't have a all the full-fledged linkages in place to really do, do something more systematic. There's a, that's great, Martin. There's another question that came in from Jim Russell who said, great presentation, thank you. I'm from New Zealand where we have National Child Health Surveillance Program from age zero to 4.5 years. Are any of these development instruments connected to early child health surveillance programs? Sorry, can you clarify again what the the surveillance would this be screening monitoring for certain things and then whether those have been linked and maybe jen can answer answer ask the question if i didn't get it right jen i've also just unmuted you as well You have to unmute yourself, Jen. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen. Jen, I just unmuted you if... But you have to unmute yourself, Jen, also. If you look at the left bottom part of your screen. Okay. I, I don't know unless Macarena, unless you, you know. There you go. Can you, Jen? Should be unmuted now. If it doesn't work, we can go to a couple of the other questions that I saw earlier. Right. Why don't we do that? And then maybe, Jen, if you can just clarify what the surveillance specifically does. Um, and I mean, happy to have others kind of coordinate here, but I think the question after Lisa's was, have you seen interest in these outcomes from a policy funding perspective by governments? Um, yeah, that's interesting. We've had a similar question actually this morning in a similar webinar. So one example I mentioned is we went to Prince George to City Hall and talked to the group there about the trends, trends I showed you earlier with the social emotional outcomes getting worse over time. 
and it prompted them locally to create a bit of a task force and a plan to come up with better uh, youth and child health development outcome initiatives. The, 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 the EDI data collection in BC is funded by three ministries, uh, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Children and Family Development. And uh, of course, in other provinces also, it's usually with ministry uh, involvement. And they do use it to inform their kind of discussion. So it's primarily a kind of tool to inform government uh, discussions. And I think to some extent also resource allocation. We do see that for their targets, let's say in their school plans, they they say that they're aiming for different EDI vulnerability rates, and then some of their initiatives are tied to supporting families accordingly. So, so yes, it's used. Um, it's hard to say to what extent we see a clear connection between uh, initiatives and outcomes. And then maybe one final thing, the funding uh, piece is really important, not just for, um, see governments but i think local organizations service organizations they often use edi outcomes to uh, ask for funding because it's such a rare scenario that you have representative data on early child outcomes and they really do specify or localize need and uh, people say that it helps their applications for funding so if i can just add um i think you know i it does really depend on the government. And I, I really cannot stress that uh, more strongly. There are some that definitely have social um, values kind of up front, and we see changes uh, in terms of attention paid to the results. So on the on the kind of high level, uh, this, is, this, this is very, uh, if I can say so, vulnerable um, area. Um, but at the local level, the way Martin described, uh, we have communities, local health regions, schools, um, organizations uh, that regularly uh, kind of look forward to seeing their um, the EDI results because they usually come every three years or every two years, depending on the province. Um, and this, these are, the, the paths are very different in each province. So it happens in a different way in Ontario, different way in BC, different way in Manitoba. I think help uh, in BC has much more kind of direct contact with communities. In Ontario, it's a much larger province, obviously nothing in comparison with California, but still. Um, so this happens in more kind of indirect ways. In Manitoba, there's again, a little bit more connection and direction, but there's definitely big uptake. There is still a lot of uh, the, what we do and our colleagues and friends do in terms of um, uh, making sure that communities understand that they have these data, that these data are available for them. But those that use them um, really look forward to the next wave. Um, are there any other uh, questions for Magdalena or for uh, Martin? There's two still on the board. I can, I can try to address very quickly. Um, yeah, okay, go ahead, because I'm not seeing them, go ahead. So one is about children placed in foster care, and um, we're not, I'm not sure whether you are in BC, uh, Martin, because as, as um, I, I'm not sure whether I made that clear before. In Canada, um, most of these um, databases are done provincially. So there's no way that we could kind of pull, put all the EDI data. Um, unlike we can do it at the neighborhood level, but we can't do it at the in individual level nationally. So all these things happen provincially. So it's not always possible, but um, there is a couple of papers. There is a study in, from New South Wales in Australia that looks at foster children in foster care. And there are a couple of studies also from Australia that look at children who are, have been um, at, at risk or have been, um, uh, signaled as um, experiencing or potentially flagged for maltreatment. And uh, the results are really um, quite mind boggling because there is really no gradient in terms of the potential exposure to maltreatment, whether it was actually proven and somebody was charged or whether it was just a suspicion. If a child even experiences a suspicion of maltreatment, their vulnerabilities are very mu at much more risk for vulnerability um, than those who are a control sample. Um, and to Efren, hello Efren, question. Um, 
there's there is there are, there are groups like that and it generally um shows that these are the children who basically have everything else going for them so you know good socioeconomic uh, situation because you do have children who are vulnerable that still come from high SES families not as many of them as from other at the other end of the scale but and so quite often these would be the ones that were actually quite able to kind of make that leap to non-vulnerable or kind of doing well status um, uh, from EDI to later grades. Martin, over to you. Are there um, any other questions? I think Martin wants to say something, but he seems to be muted. Sure. Oh. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just put it into the um, into the the text thread. There's um, uh, there is a student here that looked at the association between well-being and social support with the MDI, and you know I I'm just trying to double check that I'm not kind of misunderstood. But you ask about foster care. Um, so the, these measures. So yes, the MDI. We do have children that indicate, uh, or we have records that they were in foster care or are in foster care. And what we do see is that adult support at home and in the school is a very strong protect protective factor in regard to their celebrated life satisfaction and well-being. Uh, as you would expect, I mean, we see the same pattern for others, but it may be uh, even doubly important for uh, this vulnerable group. Great. Well, uh, oh, there's Jen Russell uh, again. Um, you can see the question on the question and answer board. Okay. Uh, I'll just read it out. The New Zealand Child Health Surveillance Program is a series of child health checks where all New Zealand children are assessed by a nurse interviewer at various stages. The Ministry of Health collects the data. Some measures include um, a screening for things like autism, strengths and difficulty questionnaire, hearing and vision. There are anthropomorphic measures also. I'm wondering whether the toddler and EDI are standalone pieces of health infrastructure, whether they are incorporated in the existing health programs in early childhood. In New Zealand, I can see how we might incorporate the NDI into our child health surveillance program. Yeah, that's very interesting. We have pursued for quite a while now a linkage between the ages and stages questionnaire, which has been used here in BC. Uh, and I'm not gonna say it's uh, very similar to the strength and difficulties or uh, the specific screening tools you're using, but same idea, broadly speaking where at nine months or 18 months, there's universal screening in some jurisdictions. We have the data, we have the EDI data for some of the children, but we are still in the process of getting the linkage. All to say is these things are taking place in some jurisdictions here in BC, and we're, uh, we're trying to create the linkages. And in fact, for the TDI, the tool that I described at the tail end of the presentation, we're working with a group that is implementing universal screening as well. So we're specifically trying to link those data to come up with more validity evidence and see what the benefit is of collecting them side by side. I wish I could give you more uh, answers empirically, but not from our own uh, findings or data. So just to add, and you know, Jim, please feel free. If you think that there is space for EDI in, in New Zealand, we'd be more than happy to talk to you. The I think the, the difficulty sometimes for us, at least, and you know, in Ontario, the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education don't necessarily work together. So the the EDI, by the virtue of its nature, that it's teacher completed, belongs to the educational system. So. Um, again, you know, this is it's, the, the, the advantages of the population level coverage is that you have to work with government surve surveillance or, you know, systems. So, um, so that's why we know the EDI is not part of the health surveillance. It is part of educational kind of data collection, which is really nice. So then uh, the same way as our later 
standardized tests are, but not the health part. So uh, in Ontario, we don't have the ages and stages, we don't have the TDI, we have something else that's being done, but it's very, very much a screening and information tool with not very much usable data. And so this is really kind of something that, that you know, we would like to um, incorporate and develop further, but it does not, in Ontario does not exist. There is more of that kind of type of linkage in Manitoba, but again, not necessarily a developmental tool in those early, very early stages. Here, I'm just, um, I think there's a question by F. F. Rain. Um, did I, um, and I just want to make sure I go back to the one, I hope people can see this. Um, the question was about whether some children start off poorly on the EDI and then do well over time. And I realized I went through some of these very quickly. For the refugee children, we certainly have seen the subgroup that falls exactly in that to, into that category. Um, if you look here, the children that are doing poorly in terms of their literacy numeracy at kindergarten, some of them are catching up. And we think it's because they're socially emotionally fine, but their communication skills are not there yet. So they, they're, they're catching up, whereas there's other groups that show different trajectories. We haven't done the replication for the overall population, so partially as a matter of capacity to do that kind of research, but we're certainly intending to because that's, of course, really interesting to see how do we possibly in the long term change trajectories for the better for those kids who enter vulnerable but then turn out to be fine. I think we see the same with some of the uh, other immigrant groups, not the, just the refugees, especially if language is a barrier. If that's the only barrier, many of them seem to catch up and do quite well later on to the system. Well, with that, I think we need to bring this to a, a close, and I want to uh, thank both uh, Martin and Magdalena for great presentations. I apologize for some of the technical difficulties and we'll hopefully work the, some of those out um, between now and the next in the series. Uh, uh, again, there'll be a, another webinar that'll be coming up on uh, February uh, 12th. Um, it'll be advertised on our website and we'll be getting that out to everyone. Um, we'll be sending out uh, a list of the whole series uh, as well. Um, so uh, please contact me or Whitney or Erica if you want more information about that. And again, thanks again uh, to our presenters and, uh, and for joining us today. And with that, we'll conclude the presentation. Thank you.